Hello, everyone. I want to thank the conference organizers for inviting me. I so wish I could be with you in person, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate virtually, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you during the Q&A. I really hope this works. Here goes. My talk today is based on a book I'm currently co-writing with historian Jillian Weiss, and I want to point out that this presentation is a collaborative effort. Our book aims to demonstrate how Mediterranean maritime art and the forced labor on which it depended was fundamental to the politics and propaganda of France's King Louis XIV, who, as you all know, ruled from 1643 to 1715. This mode of representation is something we're examining across a wide range of artistic productions, including ship design, artillery sculpture, medals, paintings, and prints. Our project emphasizes the thousands of esclaves Turk, or enslaved Turks, who were captured to per or purchased to row on French royal galleys, despite an early modern legal tradition which maintained that there were no slaves in France, and indeed that any slave who set foot on French soil should go free. I should clarify that the term esclave Turc, or Turk, which I will use throughout, was loosely employed in 17th century France to denote geopolitical, religious, and servile status. It could refer to subjects of the Ottoman Sultan, Muslims who were not necessarily Ottoman subjects, or slaves from Muslim lands, who in some cases turned out to be Christians or Jews. Along with convicts and Protestants who were condemned to row galleys after the 1685 revocation of the Edict of Nantes, these subjugated Turks not only served as oarsmen, but they also helped build and decorate galley ships and other artistic forms. In addition, they became a pervasive motif in maritime-themed art, appearing, for example, in this design on the left by Charles Lebrun for the French warship known as the Royal Louis, where the bound figure to the left of the king, seen also in a detail at the top right, is clearly an enslaved Turk, and on the ceiling of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, as you see in the medallion below. And I'll come back to both of these images later on. Previous scholars have interpreted such figures as traditional allegories of royal conquest, expressed through the language of enslavement that was common to both ancient and Renaissance rulers. In so doing, however, they have missed the allusion to actual esclave Turk, who served as both laboring objects and artistic subjects. Ultimately, our book aims to explore how and why these figures and the forced labor they embodied was celebrated rather than concealed and what this mode of representation signified. Specifically, how it was used to make related claims by several constituencies, including the monarchy and its naval officers, as well as religious groups like the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta. By showing how the display of Turkish slaves and Mediterranean maritime art more generally constituted a significant, if overlooked, aspect of visual culture in Louis XIV's France, we hope to shift the dominant attention away from Paris and Versailles and from so-called high artistic forms and reorient it towards ships and towards the sea. Today, however, what I'd like to do is explore the fluid networks of exchange that existed in this period between Paris and Versailles and the southern port cities of Marseille and Toulon. This mode of propaganda was not something enacted only on the periphery of the kingdom, on the coast, but in the capital as well. It entailed the movement of hundreds, if not thousands, of subjugated laborers, as well as royal officials, artists, and artworks. As Louis XIV began developing his iconography of absolute power, especially after assuming personal rule in 1661, Mediterranean naval supremacy, and galley ships in particular, became a key aspect of the royal image, and references to it pervaded the city of Paris, as well as the palace and gardens of Versailles. So in my talk today, I want to focus on Mediterranean coercion as fundamental to the Sun King's image, a mode of representation that could be effective, but was also unstable, and that it could be ridiculed or subverted by Louis XIV's critics. Louis XIV's declaration of personal rule coincided with royal assertion of control over Marseille and with the crown's efforts to build up its navy and galley fleet. These ships facilitated France's commercial expansion in the Mediterranean, both by transporting goods and by protecting against pirates based in North Africa, most notably in Algiers. 
Louis XIV's reestablishment of commerce and navigation in the early 1660s was later celebrated in this painted medallion by Lebrun, which was located in a prominent position on the ceiling of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. According to a written description, it portrays Louis XIV cleansing the seas of enchained corsairs, thereby reviving trade in his kingdom. Dressed as a Roman conqueror, the king is shown using a trident to subdue three turbaned men, while a line of ships in the background appears ready to depart and bring back riches for France. Constructing galleys was a key component of this naval expansion, which was overseen first by Colbert and then by his son, the Marquis de Seignelay. Seignelay appears in the painting on the left, attributed to Jean-Baptiste de la Rose, who headed up the painting studio at the Toulon Arsenal and made several such works for the king. By 1688, thanks to decades of feverish shipbuilding and slave buying throughout the Mediterranean and along Ottoman Habsburg battlefields, 40 oar-driven galleys were ready to launch. As the official description for the royal medal at the top right announced, the king had purchased, quote, a quantity of esclave Turk for the rowing force, end quote. Together with convicts, 2,000 Ottoman and Moroccan slaves toiling for the Sun King comprised about a quarter of Marseille's population at the time. So the question is, why did Louis XIV devote so many resources to galleys, especially given that by the last quarter of the 17th century, they had been technologically outmoded by warships that could move more quickly and be more heavily armed? Certainly galleys remained useful as coastal patrols and as floating prisons, but their greatest significance was symbolic. With intricate gilt wood carvings, which you can see in the surviving fragment of a royal galley at the bottom right, as well as elaborate silk banners and symmetrical benches packed with shirtless, shackled rowers, galleys were stunning pieces of performance art. At sea, they linked Louis XIV not only to classical conquerors, but also to medieval crusaders, like the French king who became Saint Louis. On land, their construction, as the painting on the left indicates, was also a spectator sport, one that depended on the participation of slaves. And in fact, the use of slaves as laborers, artisans, and sometimes even studio assistants, as in the case of the artist Pierre Puget, is an important component of our project, but it's not one that I have time to go into today. I would be happy to discuss it in more detail, however, during the Q&A. Another useful aspect of these Mediterranean galleys was that they helped counter domestic and foreign criticism about France's so-called unholy alliance, or rather its long-standing commercial agreements with the Ottoman Empire. After 1685, condemned Protestants would also be compelled to lend their bodies to Louis XIV's carefully crafted identity as a dual conqueror of unbelief. While Huguenot oarsmen embodied royal triumph over heresy, infidel ones proclaimed royal ascendancy over Islam. While at sea, galley slaves were sometimes scarcely visible, with only the sounds of cracked whips, jangling irons, and heaving oars to indicate their presence, ship sculptures regularly alluded to their laboring bodies and chains. The most spectacular Mediterranean warship of Louis XIV's reign was a 110-gun, 2,400-ton behemoth built from 1667 to 69 and known fittingly as the Royal Louis. And this presentation drawing by Lebrun on the right represents the ship about a decade after it was built. Although in later years, Colbert would come to realize that such heavy decoration compromised the seaworthiness of royal vessels, in this period, he still believed that such ornaments were vital for demonstrating France's maritime superiority, and he commissioned Lebrun to create this decorative program. Whereas the Royal Louise Officers' Salon featured illusionistic paintings of Turks appearing to salute seamen, its stern included a relief carving of Louis XIV dressed as a Roman emperor with two chained slaves at his feet. And as I mentioned before, the figure on the left of the king, it's actually the king's right hand, but on the left of the image, is clearly an enslaved Turk. And you know, I should, I should point out that he's distinguished by his shaved head uh, with a very distinctive top knot. Uh, it was typical of the ways that Esclave Turk were represented in these kinds of images and designs. 
Now, I know there are specialists in the room who will recognize this motif of bound captives as a hallmark of Le Brun's designs for Louis XIV, used time and again for royal tapestries, fountains, and architectural projects. And I've actually taken the bottom two details from Wolf Burkhardt's new monograph on Le Brun, the sovereign artist. Bound captives were, of course, a traditional way to signify royal authority, both in antiquity and in early modern France. We can think, for instance, about Henry IV's equestrian statue on the Pont Neuf in Paris, which, until it was dismantled during the Revolution, had four chained slaves at its base, and Louis XIV's Place de Victoire monument, which I'll come back to at the very end of my talk. The iconography of bound captives could signify many things, and I don't mean to suggest that they all evoked the thousands of actual galley slaves who resided in France at this moment. However, just to go back for a minute, Le Brun's design for the Royal Louis clearly did, and I think it's fair to say that some of his other projects, especially those that combine slaves with ships, probably did as well. For instance, Le Brun depicted four pairs of slaves chained to ships at each of the corners of the ceiling of the ambassador's staircase at Versailles. You can see his study for one of these corners here, along with a colored engraving of the ceiling, um, which shows the ships delineated in red. You can see them at each of the four corners. Le Brun's biographer claimed that the ceiling celebrated the crown's victory over Dutch and Spanish forces at the Mediterranean Battle of Messina, a naval battle in which the Royal Louis, as well as French galleys manned by North African slaves, participated. In addition, Le Brun designed a monumental fountain for the courtyard of the Louvre that featured at its base four prows of ships interspersed with shackled slaves. Designed in 1668, the fountain was never built, but the project is represented in several artworks from the period, including this frontispiece to a thesis by the Marquis de Seignelay. Certainly these two projects by Le Brun, the Louvre fountain and the Versailles ceiling, had multiple symbolic resonances, proclaiming the king's global reach and his control of government, symbolically represented here as a ship of state. Even so, historians have yet to grapple with the ways that these symbolic illusions could have real-life counterparts or could conjure contemporary events in the minds of viewers. And I guess what I'm suggesting is that viewers in this period could see these drawn or sculpted, sculpted captives and think of real-life slaves, even if the connection was not expressly intended. After all, the conceit of an artwork or a statue coming to life was quite common in 17th and 18th century France. Le Brun himself flirted with the idea in the ambassador's staircase, and it was also disturbingly mobilized at the royal arsenal of Marseille. When Louis XIV's grandsons toured the port in the late 17th century, royal officials forced two Moorish, probably Moroccan, galley slaves to wear silver collars and chains and to stand frozen atop pedestals inside the arsenal as if they themselves were living statues. Yet one didn't have to travel south to see galley slaves. They were regularly visible in the capital as well. In 1668, while Le Prince was working on his designs for the Louvre fountain and for the Royal Louis, Colbert sent two esclaves Turc from Toulon to Paris to model for artists at the Royal Academy. The Crown also regularly sent a fresh supply of galley slaves to Paris to row a ceremonial galley that traversed the waters of the Seine. You can see this galley in a detail from this topographical view of Paris, where it appears in red just behind Henry IV's equestrian statue on the Pont Neuf. Perhaps the artist wanted to make a point here about how both objects expressed sovereignty through enslavement, both real and imagined. A bit farther along the Seine, next to Paris's Pont-Marie, was the so-called Tour des Galériens. It can be seen at the far left of this Perel print, just in front of the towers of Notre Dame, and I've drawn a little red arrow on the image to show you where it is. Galley slaves would be kept in this tower prior to donning heavy iron chains and embarking on a highly publicized forced march from Paris to Marseille. 
This was one way that Louis XIV circulated his message of royal power and the threat of corporal punishment throughout his kingdom. These forced marches were the inverse of more celebratory slave processions that took place whenever French subjects who had been captured and enslaved in North Africa were brought back to France. These processions, one of which is shown at the bottom, took a reverse route from Marseille to Paris, and its participants did not wear iron chains, but rather silk ribbons held aloft by children dressed as angels. Eventually, these ransomed French captives would make their way to Versailles, where they would be received by Louis XIV, who in this way presented himself as both enslaver and liberator. At Versailles, Mediterranean galleys were so crucial for projecting the Sun King's magnificence that he commissioned one for the model flotilla that was created for the Grand Canal. At its height, this flotilla numbered some 60 ships, several of which can be seen in the background of the Perel print on the left. On the right is probably a study for the flotilla's galley, which was used to transport courtiers as well as foreign ambassadors from Siam and elsewhere. Along with convicts sent from Toulon, its rowers included 54 so-called Moorish slaves whom the crown had purchased from Africa specifically for this purpose in 1680. And again, the term Moorish or Moor in this context probably means Moroccan. An entry in the Mercure Galante recounts how these slaves were lined up at Versailles to await inspection by the king. Describing their bodies in sculptural terms, with bare chests, quote, of a black so gleaming that it seemed like varnish, end quote, the account suggests how these men were viewed as complementing the ornate designs of the ships they rode, and it also mobilizes the living statue conceit that I mentioned earlier. In 1683, some of these galley slaves were pressed into the service of the Princesse de Conti, who had them trail behind her during a royal ball where she masqueraded as Queen of Egypt. The following year, an Algerian ambassador traveled to Versailles. He was there to ratify a peace treaty ending a war that Algiers had declared on France over Louis XIV's refusal to return promised Algerian galley slaves. In 1682 and again in 1683, French naval forces had bombarded Algiers with a new type of war vessel known as a bomb catch. And interestingly enough, test experiments for this bomb catch had been conducted on the Versailles Canal. These bombardments were celebrated in a multimedia propaganda campaign that sometimes, as in the case of this almanac print, exaggerated the number of Algerians killed or targets destroyed. The ambassador's visit, commemorated in this medal, which shows him kneeling humbly before Louis XIV, also provided the crown with an opportunity to emphasize France's triumph over a suppliant Africa, as the medal's inscription proclaims. While at Versailles, the Algerian ambassador toured the palace and was also taken to Marly, which had just been finished that year. Although Marly was meant to serve as a pleasure retreat, where the king could escape from his constant wars and the rigorous demands of court, in fact, military and maritime themes were prominent throughout. These included a series of paintings depicting French bombardments of Mediterranean and Ottoman-controlled ports, including one of the Algerians' bombardments. They were made by the Dutch painter Jan van Beek, whose membership in the Royal Academy had been pushed through by Le Prince, probably so that van Beek could get to work quickly on the paintings for Marly. Although the image of Algiers doesn't survive, this depiction of the bombardment of Ottoman kiosks which may have served as its pendant, gives a sense of what it looked like. The Algerian ambassador also toured the Versailles gardens and sailed along the canal, after which he purportedly claimed that, quote, the sea of Versailles was the sea of the emperor of the world, end quote. Published in the Mercure Galante, this hyperbolic quote suggests the extent to which this encounter served as an opportunity for Louis XIV to tout his supremacy in the Mediterranean, and his triumph over the Muslim infidel. Royal officials were emphasizing both themes in numerous religious commissions around this time, notably in a pair of liturgical manuscripts created for the Invalides 
and for the new royal chapel of Versailles, which was dedicated to Saint Louis, the Crusader King. The image of chained Turks at the bottom of the vase of flowers in the image on the right, and I hope you're able to see them, they're surrounded by trophies, was made for the Andalide manuscript, and it comes just before a recounting of Saint Louis's life and exploits. Louis XIV was involved in the production of both texts, and we should note that they were contemporary with the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, in other words, a period in which he was taking pains to present himself as, quote, the most Christian king. Yet this representational strategy, and in particular Louis XIV's claim to be a vanquisher of Turks, invited satirical attacks, particularly from Protestant artists based in the Netherlands, England, Belgium, and Germany. They produced scores of medals and pamphlets mocking the Sun King's most Christian status and accusing him not only of partnering with the Ottoman Turks, but of being a slave to the commercial riches they provided. For example, the satirical print on the left, which appeared in a counterfeit edition of a medallic history of Louis XIV, inverts the official medal depicting the Algerian visit and instead proclaims a suppliant France underneath an image of the Sun King bowing down before the day of Algiers. And here's a slightly different version of one of the actual medals of this subject that was produced. These so-called insolent medals had a fairly wide circulation, and even Louis XIV acquired examples of them for his own royal collection. So just to quickly conclude, you may have already noticed that the inscription at the bottom of this medal says Viro Immortali, or To the Immortal Man. It refers to an honorific, if controversial, slogan that appeared at the base of the King's Place de Victoire monument, which was unveiled in 1686. As such, it suggests how these attacks lampooned not only Louis XIV's hypocritical fight against the Ottoman infidel, but also his self-image as a conqueror of slaves. Though this representational mode did burnish the Sun King's image in certain elite circles, it also invited accusations of his subservience on the one hand and his despotism on the other. Indeed, the notion that royal absolutism stemmed from slavery and oppression would become a common trope during the Enlightenment and Revolutionary eras, and it's one reason why this iconography lost favor in the later 18th century. However, during Louis, the, Louis the XIV's reign, enchained slaves, though already unstable, remained a vital means of projecting royal power, recalling both ancient precursors and the Mediterranean galleys of which the Sun King was so very proud. Thank you very much.